one, rest of Aquamax here. And we've got some things going on. Let's see. Um, okay, I'm trying to catch up on the chat here. I can't go back. I don't know why. Let me see. I'm going to change things and see if that doesn't really help. But, hey, Ken, I'm glad uh, you gave me that suggestion. And I love Rift Tracks. Um, MST, 3K. I actually got to see them live um, in the sense that they were at a, like a Comic-Con type thing. And I, they, they actually riffed on me. It was awesome. It was really fun. So, let's see. So, hello, Albatross Gaming and Cheyenne Geckos and Ken Malinsky. Zijun Zhu, I'm probably pronouncing you wrong. Um, Toilet Pete, Hermit the Hermit Crab, Frank the Tank, Chad Kratz, and Sean Meister. Greetings all. We've got a fair number of people in right away, which is great. And today, the live stream is going to feature all the beetles that I keep. So I'm excited to uh, share with you all the beetles from feeder species to pet species. CS, howdy, from Ohio. Awesome. And Kale Siv. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I, uh, I do really try, so I really appreciate it. And Mickey M, yeah, right when we started up. And Joshua Zavala, nice to have you in the house. Things are going pretty well. Let's see. So Basement Pets used to have beetles. You'd like to get some more? Oh, you should. Beetles are fun. All right. So let's just dig in, folks, shall we? And I'll start answering some question. The Kaiju Isu channel. Um, so... Wow, so you have two channels? Is that how that works, Ken? Because I know Ken is uh, the Kaiju ISO channel guy. It has isopods on his channel. And there's Gemma K. And, oh, Albatross came and get a rhino beetle. Awesome. Formal top hat. Hello. So these, let's see who, you know what these guys are. Who can tell me what these guys are? Space Kraken X. Excellent. Thank you for joining in. Ah, got it. Makes sense. Makes sense, Ken. Who knows what species these are? Tarantula bee. Greetings. Ah, good guess. They're not bean beetles or green weevils, but they are confused flower beetles. Frank to tank. Yep. Um, I have cultured bean beetles before. I don't currently do that, but I have before. Um, these are, as you can see, very, very diminutive. You look at my hands. This is a two ounce deli cup. Beetles are very, very tiny. And these are a feeder species. Very, very easy to breed. Basically, you put them in a container with some... You can use rice flour, you can use wheat flour, you can mix the two. I often put... I usually use a base mixture of rice flour wheat, and wheat flour in about one part... White, rice flour, one part wheat flour. And then I add things like um, green pea flour, a little spirulina, some nutritional yeast, just for some extra nutrients. And... Uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. And you just leave them alone for a while. And if you look up close, I don't have my macro lens on because that gets tricky, but you can see that there are larvae as well as a lot of beetles in here, in with some of the substrate that's in there. This is not where I culture them. I culture them in a large yogurt container. I don't know if there's probably some pupae in here. I can't actually, you know, set any out. I mean, distinguish any from the substrate right now, but I, I do see some pupae kind of in there um, along with the larvae. The, the most difficult thing about culturing these guys is just uh, separating the larvae from the adults. It's not that hard, but you can pour a whole bunch up to the top of a bottle cap, set that bottle cap into a larger container. The, most of the adults will crawl out and relatively few of the larvae will crawl out over an hour or so. And then you can feed off relatively pure larvae. You don't want to feed the adults in most cases. Most creatures won't eat the adults because they contain um, basically bitter substances. Um, right now the name is escaping me. I totally know what the name is, but, um, of the group of chemicals that they produce that taste bad, but it's some kind of repugnatorial, uh, fluid that, for example, dart frogs will spit these out, things like that. But the larvae don't have that, and so the larvae make a great food for dart frogs, micro geckos, very small creatures of various sorts. So whether they're amphibians, reptiles, or invertebrates, they make good food for fish as well. I fed them to fish and fish love the larvae as well. So yeah, um, that's kind of uh, 
the deal with these guys. Um, so Tarantula B, Porcelio Hazai, that is one I have not kept. Um, from what I know, it's kept similarly to the large Spanish Porcelio, so once good ventilation, uh, one moist spot, but the rest of the enclosure should be fairly dry, and um, concave bark structures to hide under on both the moist side and the dry side. That's, that's about all I know, because I haven't kept them. So, I guess I answered formal Top Hat's question. Um, my morning geckos eat these, more specifically my um, Leucomelus dart frogs eat these, and I've fed them to small fish as well. And Frank Detank, you're right, we do have some nice stags and dynasties in the U.S. Um, but the more, more would be more fun, I mean, but we can't really go too far. So, why can't I remember the name? That's so ridiculous. I feel, I feel dumb that I'm not remembering the name of that chemical substance um, that they produce. And a lot of beetles do produce it. It may be similar to the ones that mealworms produce, but I'm not sure if it's the same. Um, hey, Jordan's in the house. Nice to have you in, Jordan. And formal top hat. Actually, these guys, I do feed these to my dart frogs, but there's not a colony living there because these need low humidity. They would die in the dart frog enclosure after, you know, maybe 48 hours or something like that. Uh, but good question. Here's the next beetle. We're going to jump in. Um, oh, Jim, I do hope you get some dart frogs soon. And Thoropods, greetings. Oh, Frank the Tank has some Dynastis Granti. Those are amazing beetles. Tell you what. Okay, so any guesses which beetle you're going to see in here? I'd love to, to see what you think. Some things are already starting to give it away. You can see some activity down there. Albatross Gaming, your isopods died off. One of your cultures died. Well, you know what? If you want to send me some pictures of your enclosures and a little bit more explanation of your enclosures, I'd be happy to see what I can do to help. What is the most boring pet that I keep? I don't know. I, um, I don't think anything is boring really that I keep. The only thing is that some things are not very surface active. Like I have certain isopods or millipedes that stay more under the surface and so I don't see them often and I guess that might count, I guess. But I still find them really interesting when I find them. Um, so what isopods do you recommend with dart frogs? My three big ones that I would recommend are, well, four. Dwarf Whites, Dwarf Purples, Isopoda Species Tarragona, and um, Florida Fast. They all do really well in moist uh, conditions, and they are small enough so that dart frogs can pick off the smaller ones, but some of the adults will survive. Actually, with dart frogs, they can eat adult um, Dwarf Whites and Dwarf Purples, but they breed fast enough, so it's okay. Um, so... Oh, I was thinking, thank you, Sean Meister. I was thinking of benzoquinones. And hydroquinone was enough to spark my memory. So thank you. Benzoquinones were the ones I was thinking of. Thank you, Sean. You got it. Um, would any larger animals do well with dart frogs? Some people say they do. But I don't really recommend it. Okay, well, albatross gaming. So far, that's sounding like everything's going right. But obviously something happened. Um, we'll have to figure that out. So these, this is my mealworm culture, as you can see. Type of darkling beetle from the group Tenebrionidae and the genus Tenebrio, which is based on the word darkness, which is where darkling comes from. Um, in Italian, I know I mentioned I speak Italian, the word for darkness is tenebre. So it's related. Um, having trouble focusing my camera. Um, so yeah, I've got a ton of uh, mealworms in here. You can see the mealworm beetles. Um, as you notice, I culture these guys in a way that is a little bit different than a lot of people. I've experimented with different ways. I actually really love the um, leaf litter, cocoa fiber, and oatmeal as the substrate. They seem to do better in it. There seems to be less cannibalism of the eggs and larvae and pupae, and they produce well enough for what I need. I mean, they produce well without having to separate them or anything like that. And there are lots in here. You just dig around, and I kind of scared them earlier when I moved them, but there's a lot of um, mealworms in here, so whenever I want to feed our leopard gecko or whatever, I just come in here and I can find them, and they're always adults, they're always pupae, always small larvae, always larger larvae and medium-sized larvae. So this setup works pretty well. There's a nice freshly molted, well, not extremely freshly molted, but it's still a little bit light-colored. These are good for um, feeding to my uh, 
like spiders they like the the freshly molted ones so and i do have some other worms um yes and there is a lot of frass in here it's about time to change the substrate actually um dark fries awesome i'm glad that they're doing well only 10 of them they've gone through dried shrimp that many dried shrimp that's awesome so the depressed manatee i don't actually know where you can find pill millipedes for sale i know that bugs in cyberspace has had them before but it's not like a regular thing so good question and i'll show you some other worms too um let's see do i have other worms other than superworms i'm not sure i don't have any night crawlers now i have raised a couple of different species of composting worms in the house and these guys um i generally what I do is, since they're eating um, a lot of fruits and vegetables normally, I just, I count that for, it's not the same as gut loading with really high nutrient stuff all the time, but um, they have the leaf litter, they have um, the veggies and stuff, and I just dust them. So they are generally, you know, have recently eaten some highly nutritious things like sweet potatoes or something like that, that has like vitamin A in it and stuff. There's a newly, newly morphed pupa right there still kind of long and skinny instead of curled still light colored so hopefully that helps um yeah I, I don't necessarily gut load them a lot but i do dust them so let's see so how do i feel about earthworms in a vivarium i don't like it usually because they will kind of overwhelm the substrate really fast and you don't want the substrate to break down in a bioactive vivarium too fast, and they will tend to break it down faster than other things. At least accelerate the breakdown process, let's put it that way. And so I don't, I don't do it. I don't put them in. I know some people do, and it, it can work. Um, yeah, and that's true. I do feed um, variety. Um, let's see. Let's see, Theropod Hunter, hello. Zi Junzo, taking out my blue death and be able to watch with you, awesome. How often do you clean the mealworm culture? Um, I try to do it, I put a date on it and just kind of keep an eye on it depending on how many there are in there. Um, like Frank was mentioning, there's a lot of frass in there, it's about time. Um, every three or four months is probably good if I can manage that. Um, so, Oh, isopod source has the um, the pill millipedes. That's true. It's uh, the one that starts with an R. The genus name starts with an R. That's true. I forgot about that. Oh, yes. Looking for the new website from Bugs in Cyberspace. Um, Theropod Hunter. What other invertebrates mix well with domino roaches? Good question. Someone who keeps roaches, maybe they can chime in on that because I do not know. So... These are super worm beetles. There's only a couple in here because this culture is to the point where um, I need to... There's a few hiding under there. Um, there they go. You can see they're a lot bigger than the mealworm beetles. Um, there are only a few in here because this, is, this culture is to the point where the larvae are you know, starting to develop and the adults have just died off. I just removed a bunch of dead adults recently and the larvae are starting to show up in here. But this is a fairly new one. And, but the beetles are, as you see, much bigger, and I'll tell you what I do. There are different ways to get them to produce beetles. They don't pupate very well in large enclosures together like mealworms do. So what you do is you take the larvae out when they're big and you put them in a separate small container like a deli cup. You could use a deli cup like this one with just one or two ventilation holes poked in it with a pin. Put it in there. You don't need food, water, substrate, or anything. Put it in the dark and they will do that. But what I, I do is I just put them in my uh, leopard gecko enclosure they dig down into the substrate and they metamorphose down there and then they come up as beetles and then I leave some in there for a while for a cleanup crew but then I'll take them out in here, put them in here so that they can breed and it works very well. Let me show you what I mean by works very well. Right here is the results of um, production. Um, these are all babies that I got from that method, and there are so many in here, and it looks like the, the, there's a lot of frass in here too. I need to get in here and do some cleaning, but there are a ton of big old superworms in here from just 
throwing adults, you know, throw in a dozen or so adults, you can do more than that. There's a lot of these superworm beetles in here. I mean, superworm larvae. And the nice thing about superworm larvae is they generally don't pupate a lot when they're crowded and when they are, you know, they're crowded. They don't pupate. They wait to pupate. And so you can decide, well, this one looks big enough. You know, I could say, yeah, that one, it could grow a little bit more, but I've, these are, you know, the younger ones. I do have a, a group of them that are bigger, but these could pupate. They'd just be a little bit on the small side. And then uh, you decide when you want to do it. And they'll just stay alive for months and you throw in vegetables and fruits like you do for mealworms and they'll eat it. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. Oh, and Jordan, um, I did... Uh, I did mention that, but I'll just mention it again quickly. I don't really gut load. I just feed a variety and I supplement. Um, so, yeah, that's basically how that works. Um, good question. And Ken. Yes, bumblebee millipedes are awesome. So is Wally, Supreme Gecko. I wonder how many there are down at the bottom. Yeah, there's a ton down there. If I just mess with the substrate, you can see a bunch of these beetles. So I, I went for years without really breeding these guys. And then I just decided, eh, I'll give it a go. And it's turned out to be really easy. And they're nice and big and juicy. So sometimes, and they're another food item that's, you know, it's some variety. They're a little different from mealworms nutritionally. Their, their um, chitinous exoskeleton is a little bit softer than mealworms. And so they're really nice for that. Um, our leopard gecko loves these. And they're softer, so I give these, I don't give a lot of mealworms to our crestes, but I'll give them the superworms once in a while because they're a little softer. Because they, they just don't have the, uh, the temperature that they need. They don't prefer the temperatures that allow them to digest things like that as much. So, um, let's see. All right. There you go. And Supreme Gecko's in the house. Guess what, everybody? I just thought I'd announce. Supreme Gecko is going to be on the show. Is it next week? It's either one or two weeks from now. It's the uh, 13th, I believe, of October. So that's two weeks, right? So, yeah. And I'm really excited to have him on the show. So that'll be fun. Um, so, Dagon Hunt. I wish I had some scarabs to show you. I don't have any scarabid beetles, but um, I'm going to pull out some other beetles in just a second. I'm just kind of going over what I've got here. Make sure. Um... As I was saying before, I have re raised uh, bean beetles before. I'm not currently doing that. So let's look at you know Supreme Gecko Wally. That's it's an interesting thing where you're talking about the the mealworms in your isopod colonies and they were healthy. I've noticed that occasionally in other containers too, like in with the uh, leopard gecko. Sometimes you'll find them, they're such a, they're like a different color and they're very, very active. So it's interesting, but with isopods it's a little more shocking because they're going to be a more moist substrate. So that's pretty cool. And okay, let's see. Did it work? So beetle breeding Vincent. I tried to make you a a mod. Did it work? I hope so. Tried to do that. Um, so let's see. Do you have hissers? I don't because I don't have any any roaches at all. But there's zero cool and forest oasis. Um, so beetle breeding Vincent, somehow it's not making you a, a, a moderator. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. I tried. Why is it not doing that? What's up with that? Okay. Um, let's see. So let's, let me show you what I got here. Okay. So this beetle here, this is almost certainly Eliodes, um, Hispilabris, which means something like the hairy-lipped Eliodes. Um, 
these are local. I just catch these up in the canyon, literally five minute drive from my house. And they're a, a medium sized Eleotis beetle, not huge as you can see, but they're a cool little beetle. And in the springtime and in the summer, especially the evenings, go up in the canyon here and they're just all over the place. So um, they're, they're kind of fun. So maybe we could call them the mustache darkling beetle. Um, they're in the group known as desert clown beetles because they'll stick their abdomen up in the air to um, threaten potential predators. And then if um, the threat display doesn't um, deter them, they will spray a repugnatorial fluid. I think they, I don't remember what the mix they spray is, but it's kind of nasty. It doesn't smell very good. And um, so yeah, there you go. So Forest Oasis, your beetles haven't arrived yet, huh? I hope they drive soon. So let's look at some other beetles here. My largest two Eleotis beetles, these are Eleotis obscurus or obscura. I always get the, the name messed up. You can see they're very similar in appearance, but they're larger. They're considerably larger than the uh, Hispilabris. Probably almost twice as, ma <laughs> <coughs> twice as massive. And I've got a couple of these. One of them I've had well over a year now. And uh, the other one I collected this spring. And let's see. I do have blue death veining beetles, and we'll be looking at those in a minute. And yeah, these two can produce, um, these are also desert clown beetles and can produce a nasty scent. And if you uh, encounter them in the wild, they'll often stick their abdomen up into the air to indicate that they mean business and that they will deter any predators with a liquid spray like a skunk. So sometimes they're called skunk beetles, clown beetles, desert beetles and so on. Okay, so dark forest animations, you have an important question. I think feather millipedes are cool. I had some quite a while ago and I didn't quite get their husbandry down and I, I lost them. But I think if I were to care for them now, I'd probably do a better job. Um, it was quite a while ago. And Ooh, we got the legs almost to 30. Now, this one here, this is not a, a clown beetle. Although I think it can spray a repugnatorial fluid. Somebody did. You can see a little bit of it right there. And it might have been this guy. I'm not sure. This is Cryptoglossa muricata. So a g different genus altogether. Also known as the um, rough death feigning beetle. It's got some rough uh, little tubercles on its um, elytrae there. And it does feign death pretty well, but it's not the same genus as uh, the blue death feigning beetle. So there you go. It's pretty cool. This was a gift from uh, Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace. And I, I love this little guy. Check out that almost metallic looking um, connective tissue between the uh, thorax and the abdomen. Pretty cool. And also between the head and the thorax. So. Hmm, Forest Oasis, where did you get your uh, your desert beetle? Did you collect it locally? Because I know Forest Oasis lives in the same state that I do, only about an hour or so away. And the formal top hat, great question. Um, I haven't thought that far ahead. I know that the stream after the stream after this one will be uh, with Wally, so we're going to talk about geckos and isopods. Um, but now we're going to talk about these guys. And uh, when you take a look at these, um, um, dark forest animations that might sound like contaminated food. I've heard from bugs in cyberspace that um, that reaction, they can't get up, can sometimes occur from uh, food that's been contaminated if you give them like grapes that have had insecticide on them or something like that. So that could be what's going on. Um, and you're welcome, Beetle Breeding Vincent Gomez. I'm just wondering if it has to do with the number of mods I have or something. Um, so, I would have um, welcomed you as a mod, though. I want you to see if you can guess um, which two, uh, which of these two is the captive bred one. See if you can figure it out. Because um, we were wondering, like Peter, Bugs in Cyberspace and I were wondering, uh, whether or not the original one would color up. I mean, the, the captive bred one would color up 
and looked just like the adults or how long it would take and all that stuff. And obviously it occurred, it happened. And I want to see if you can tell the difference. So. Um, Albatross Gaming, I think the adults need to eat like leaves of their host plant, I think. I think they will eat beetle jelly, but I think they need to live off the leaves of their host plant. I'm not sure. I would ask Bugs in cyberspace. I'm sure uh, he is uh, better acquainted with their care because I've never had Chrysina. Forest Oasis? Okay, Southern Utah. Yeah, I've seen some really hefty ones in Southern Utah. I would actually like to collect some down there sometime. Uh, I didn't see any darkling beetles except for blue death vending beetles when I was down there uh, last time. So, well, no, that's not true. I saw a couple of small darklings, but nothing really um, huge or impressive, so I didn't uh, collect anything. And I couldn't collect the blue death vending beetle. I only saw one for one, and it was also in a, a non-collection area for another. So, yeah. Um, oh, rosy isopods in Nottinghamshire. I've never heard of that kind. So, Rochelle. Yeah, you should totally get ivory millipedes. They're super cool. And so the one... Okay, now that they're like... I don't, I'm not sure if they're fighting or what they're doing here, but it looks like mating behavior, but... The thing is, the one on the bottom, the one that's now on the right, is the captive bred one. I very carefully looked at the ones that had a similar size, and um, you can tell it's got a slightly less, uh, it's got a slightly more slender abdomen, and that's the only distinguishing feature really that I could uh, nail down. But uh, the one on top is a male. But this is the weird thing: is that uh, I think this one's a male too. Let me. No, well, no, maybe that's all it was. It's just mating behavior because I don't see a lot of uh, CT on the antennae. It's hard to say without using a macro lens, but um, yeah. So, Tom, got any giant centipedes? Not at the moment. I've had um, Scolopendra polymorpha before, but. Trilobite beetles I have seen, they are super cool, but yeah, they're rare and difficult to keep and probably not easy to um, breed. As far as we know, they're not easy to breed at all. Um, and I, I don't know, I haven't really paid that much attention. I've usually noticed my males attempting to mate, but it's possible that the females will mount the males. I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's a thing or not. So, well, um, actually I already, when I took one out, when I took this one out, he did his death fainting thing. I don't know if he would do it again. Let me try. Yeah, he's not into it right now. Um, so. So, Forest Oasis. Um, just make sure it's getting hydrated a lot, I mean, enough. You know, they don't need huge amounts of water, but if you're making sure that's getting like beetle jelly, juicy fruit, something like that, mine actually drink from my aunt. Uh, my velvet ant feeder. So that seems to make them more active when they're not thirsty, when they can be well hydrated. They seem to conserve moisture when they feel dry. So that's something to look into. It may not be what's going on in your case. Um, but it's it's something to look at. Um, yeah, these, these beetles, it's true that in general, they will not feign death if they're used to being handled a lot. They, they, at least they're less, less likely to be, um, to feign death. But when I took them out, they've one of them did it. And the males and females do look pretty similar. I mean, a lot of times the males are smaller, but that's not always true. You can only tell whether they have Cetios antennae on the, the, the bottom edge of their antennae is, is hairy on the males, and it's not so hairy in the females. They, the females do have a couple of little hairs there, but the males have more. So, good question, Hannah. And hissing cockroaches are not considered beetles. They're in a, in a different group altogether. Uh, but it's a good question, and I don't mind questions. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? So, um, so Frank Detank, you get uh, lots of larvae from which one? And beetle breeding. I don't actually have a Discord server. I know people have asked about it, but I have never uh, gotten into that. Um, it would be cool, but I haven't done it. So maybe I need to look into that. 
Mm, and what do I feed them on? Well, my blue death finding beetles get a lot of crickets. I have I breed banded crickets, and I give them the pre-killed banded crickets. They love those. I have given them cat food. I've given them oatmeal. I give them bits of vegetables and fruits, mostly uh, organic carrots is a big one. But I'll throw in zucchini and squash and all kinds of things like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, beetle jelly, of course. I get beetle jelly... Um, from Bugs in Cyberspace. It's great stuff, and they, they eat that, and it's good for them. So there you go. Cam Phillips. I have not kept any kind of roach because my wife has requested that I not keep any kinds of roach. So that's... Uh, yeah, I, I worked with some in a zoo once, but uh, that's the closest I've ever come to keeping them. And, oh, Frank Detank from Blue Death Fanny Bills get hundreds of larvae. Got it. Yeah, I have a lot of larvae right now in their tank, and I've separated some out. Um, for grow out, but I think I'm trying to figure out whether it's more efficient to just collect them when they're big and let them grow out a little bit Or if it's better to collect them when they're tiny because they do there is some cannibalism that goes on if they're um, The larvae of different sizes uh, So yeah, we'll see uh, which one is best But I want to produce a nice batch of a, a group of multiples this time, and I think I've figured it out and Yes, Jordan, excellent idea. Let's see if we can get 50 plus likes. Up to 35 right now. Yeah, pumpkin, they love pumpkin. We have a ton of, uh, what do you call them, butternut squash in the garden. And we're probably going to, you know, feed them a lot of that. Things like that. Oh, and I have fed them the, the gamma shrimp on your suggestion, Mickey M. Yeah, I went and bought some river shrimp and I fed them that too. Uh, they just love... Uh, protein sources and a lot of people don't really realize that they've done some research on them in, in the wild they're mostly eating dried insects um, so they just eat desiccated insects they find in the desert as well as vegetable matter and stuff I mean they're pretty omnivorous but uh, the focus was on the dried insects so yeah it totally makes sense um, and basement pets it is fairly difficult to get them pup to pupate but I got mine to pupate and that's where this one came from it was captive bred here at Aquarimax Pets by um, putting it into a container with substrate deeper than this, about twice this deep, with substrate about three inches deep or so, and keeping the relative humidity at uh, about 75 to 80 percent, and the temperature around 88 degrees constant, and it took a right around two months, and then they did that. And albatross gaming, yes, I do breed fish. I've bred probably about 25 different species of fish. Currently, I'm only breeding um, Neolamprologus multifasciatus, the shell-dwelling cichlid. And uh, I breed Pocelia wingi, the um, blue star endler. Those are the only ones I'm breeding right now. It's almost impossible to stop them, honestly, uh, those two species. But I have bred other fish, too. And it's fun. I just... I've kind of shifted, so I'm always going to keep fish, I think. I really like fish, but um, they're more difficult than some other things. And um, so I've shifted a lot of what I do to other things, but I definitely always want to keep fish and, and breed them to some small extent. Snailiontologist, Carolina Mint is eating threads from a spider web. Have you ever seen this? What is the reason behind it? Well... The only thing I can think of, I don't know the answer per se, but I do know that since the web is largely composed of protein and the spiders will often eat their webbing to recycle the protein, I'm imagining the, the mantis is just taking advantage of free protein. That's, that's what I'm guessing. Um, Hannah Lamb, what is the funnest, most enjoyable beetle that you take care of and why? Oh, before I answer that question, I want to get the last beetle I was going to show you, guys. Okay, just a second. Um, I can't believe I forgot to show you. Okay, now I have a dried specimen because my adults died because that's pretty normal. They don't last very long. I collected these, uh, these are called cottonwood stag beetles, Pseudolucanus mazama is the scientific name, or Lucanus um, mazama is sometimes used too. And I collected these on July 4th, pretty close to my house. It's in my state. It's only about an hour away. I collected two females and two males. And look at that. Look at that big old larva in there. And it's not the only one. There are 
some other gaps. There's another gap right there. There are, I believe, four larvae in this enclosure right here. Right now I'm only seeing one for whatever reason. They dig around. And in this one, from the other female, there's another larva right there. You can see. And there's another one down there. So there are about four larvae in each uh, container. So these are, like I said, collected July 4th, Pseudolucanus mazama. I put the females in these two containers. This is flake soil that I made myself. My first, I think, it's, yeah, it's the first batch of flake soil I ever made. And it seems to be working because they're getting big. I mean, that one larva, I mean, it's, it's large. So it's working out. Um, all right. So there you go. And let's see. I am Newt's Commander. These are two blue death fitting beetles. The one on the left right now is the captive bred individual. Uh, and you can send beetles online, and you have to be careful. Some species are illegal to ship across state lines, and others need permits and stuff like that. Um, so, Hannah, I was going to answer your question. I think. I really love the blue death fainting beetles because they're, they tend to be really active and I love their color and I love the death fainting. I really love the other darkling beetles too. Um, probably just, I, if I had to say, I'd say darkling beetles in general. And let's see. And I I don't know about shipping blue death fainting beetles to New Jersey. I'll have to look into that. I don't think I need a permit to ship them at all. I, I haven't been shipping any because I haven't been breeding them in large quantities yet. I hope eventually to be breeding them in enough quantities that I can spread them out throughout the hobby, but we'll see. Um, the Egyptian predatory beetles are awesome. I would love to keep one, but I have not. Um, and the stag beetles are awesome. I, they're fun. It's really sad that the, the adults died so quickly, but that's normal. I mean, they just this species doesn't have a really long lifespan. Um, so kind of sad. I want to see if I can find a larva of a blue death fanny beetle to show you. Um, sometimes they're hard to find in the substrate, but uh, I'll dig around and see what I can find. Sometimes it's easy. They're still pretty small, most of these, from this year's batch. But I do occasionally dig them up just to check on them, too. Hmm. I had to choose the deepest cup, didn't I? Because that's the hardest one to find them in. They're pretty good at hiding with all this stuff mixed up in the substrate, too, so... No guarantee I'm going to find anything. Um, let's see. Trying to catch up. So most darkling beetles don't seem to bite. Um, I, I don't recall ever having bitten, been bitten by a darkling beetle. I can't say that all of them are like that. But the ones that I've kept, I haven't been bitten by any. I do have some jumping spiders. I have two. I wonder if, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about the beetles, I didn't end up seeing the larva in there. Sorry, folks. So let's see if my little... Jumper wants to come out. I don't know if she does, but if she does, um, we'll see how it goes. Do you want to come out? Do you want to play? Yeah, maybe she will. You, you got to be careful with them. You, you got to be real gentle with them. They don't like to be forced to do anything. But uh, now that we've, I think, looked at all the beetles, I, I might be forgetting something, but. This is my little jumping spider here. I actually did a fairly recent video with her in it um, of her eating, hunting a fly. She's, she's a good little hunter. 
Um, and I don't think they do ever stop, stop trying to escape of the little cups. And it helps if you have some paper toweling in there, which I did have in there earlier. They usually feel a little bit more secure, so I'm going to put some of that in there. And then they're not necessarily always climbing around. Um, but if they're just in a bare container, they seem to pretty much keep going at that until they're done. Um, love her little face. Can I focus on her little face? I'll try it. Oh, look at that. She's saying hi to everybody. Um, so, snailiontologist, this is a good time to see velvet ants, as long as it's a warm day with a little humidity. Um, and I have kept antlions, theropod hunter. This is the problem I've noticed with antlions. I can get them to eat and, and everything, but I've only ever gotten one to pupate. And strangely enough, that was when I was a kid. Since then, I have never had one successfully pupate, and I don't know what happens. They eat like crazy, they do fine, then they stop building a trap door, and I think, oh, maybe they're going to molt or something, and then they just, sometimes they, they do, they appear again, but other times they don't, so I don't know what's going on. Albatross Gaming, awesome, some Phidippus Audax bred for you, that's cool. I had a female, a wild-caught female, showed up in my house and kept her last, uh, was that last summer? Yeah, last summer. And she produced uh, tons of babies. Tons of babies. So, they're, they're pretty funny that way. Um, they will, she's, this one's produced an egg sac or two, but she's never been mated, so. She, this is a Regius, Phidippus Regius. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to scare you with my thumb there. Kind of startled her. Um, so this isn't a bad time to find a praying mantis, small people society. The only problem is you're likely to find, um, you know, heavily gravid females, which is not necessarily bad. It just means that the it's not going to last a really long time because you're not going to find immatures that have a long lifespan ahead of them. You're just going to find um, old ones. And if it's a male, they're mostly likely at this point just mostly interested in mating. And depending on where you live in the U.S., like in our area, then the next month or two, they're all going to be dead because of the heavy frost. Um, but if you do find a gravid female, you could get an, an utheka or an uth out of it, which is an egg case. I've done that before. I've collected females and had them lay egg cases and then uh, hatch the egg cases. That's fun. Well, I've done that, I guess, once. And then I've also had egg cases given to me and hatched those. So that's fun. And, uh, yeah. So, Snaily intelligence, there is some variance in individuals, but uh, there are also species with particular markings. I haven't seen any species exactly like that. There are some, some that mimic velvet ants, so they tend to be red and black, like Phidippus johnsoni, I think, is one of them. But that doesn't quite sound like what uh, you're describing, so I'm not sure what you saw. Um, but praying mantis, you can find them on the sides of houses and in long, tall grass are two places I like to look when I'm looking for them. Um, let's see. How do you get food for the spiders in winter with no little flies? Well, I do breed uh, fruit flies, and even the adults will usually eat some fruit flies. But they also will eat other things. I give them uh, waxworm pupae, uh, not pupae, waxworm larvae and waxworm moths. They will eat the waxworm moths. And they will also eat um, crickets and mealworms. So they have food that I can give them in the winter. It's not the same, but it works out pretty well. Um, and Newt, I am in Utah. It's, it's about, I want to say, about a six-hour drive to Arizona from where I am. And so this spider is, is pretty good with being handled. I think she was handled a lot when she was younger before I got her and you know I try to handle her when I can and she seems to uh, you know I think it's she probably looks forward to the enrichment I guess if you can put it that way that's anthropomorphizing a little bit but uh, yeah they are very uh, personable spiders let's put it that way and they don't last a long time. Yeah, a year, maybe two, somewhere in between there. And these these are natives to the southeastern corner of the U.S. So like Florida is a common place they're found. 
but they've been selectively bred like this one for the color. You can find kind of reddish orange ones in the wild and but now they're they're coming up with all sorts of morphs. There's like a melanistic morph and there's a either there's a high white. I'm not sure if it's leucistic or albino or what. There are pink ones. There are like um, deeper red ones. There are orange ones like this. There are lots of different ones. So if you want to check some of those out, Fantastic Fids um, has all different kinds. On Instagram, you can see the different color varieties and stuff. So Supreme Gecko, I've thought of it, but I, I haven't really thought of it being extremely practical for me because I can't, you know, my wife's not really happy with the house flies. She's fine with me going outside in the spring, summer, and fall and catching them. And we feed them to our orchid mantis and we feed them to our spiders and whatnot. She's totally fine with that. And she's fine with the fruit flies. Well, I shouldn't say fine. She's not a fan of the fruit flies, but she tolerates them. But she would not tolerate me having fly larvae or pupae or adults in the house. Um, she doesn't like that. So I don't think that would really be fair to the spiders because even though I might be able to raise them on, uh, you know, other foods, they really ought to have flies in their diet. And with one, it's practical for me to go out and catch some most of the year and they can do okay for the few months we can't find them outside on the other foods. But um, really they should have a lot of flies in their life. And so I think that's, the, for, just to be fair to them, that's part of the reason or probably all of the reason I don't keep, I don't breed these. I did, like I said, bred the Fidipa Zaudax for a little while, fed them some um, fruit flies, but I released them before they got too big because they're, you know, they live here. And we had collected it on our property, so. And our spider's name is Padme. Oh, she's looking at that camera. She's like camera shy a little bit. Check it out. Native blue ones in your rose garden. That's awesome. I'd love to see some blue ones. My son sent me a short video of one that he found. He's in Missouri. And he found one. It had an interesting pattern. I'd never seen one. It looked like a Phidippus of some kind, but it didn't look anything like an Audax. Uh, it looked very different or any there's a couple of species of Phidippus in this area that I've seen there are actually several and I've only seen a couple of them but um, anyway uh, the one he had had an interesting sort of pattern on it so dwarf whites Fred Fred's flashbacks dwarf whites are pretty easy in my opinion they tend to like fairly moist substrate they like a lot of leaf litter and some rotting wood they do like their protein, so some fish food pellets or something like that will really get them going. Um, warmer temperatures will induce them to breed more quickly. Uh, if you can get it over 80 degrees, they tend to kind of explode. Mine slow down in the winter because I can't keep them as warm. But as soon as we get to, uh, you know, spring and summer, it starts warming up. And then, you know, they'll go crazy. They'll just explode. And I have a lot of them right now. So, snailiontologist, good question about the spider genetics. I don't know if it's all single gene, gene recessive stuff uh, because I haven't done any of it and I haven't delved into it deeply. I've just noticed that there are morphs out there that are selectively bred. I would assume there's a lot of single gene recessive stuff going on, but there may be some line breeding going on too. I, I'm not sure. Good question. I bet Fantastic Fids would be the one to check on with that. Um, oh! He saw a small black one with orange markings today for Halloween. That's awesome. Yeah, I've I've seen a couple with orange markings around here, the Iodax. But the, uh, not quite as orange as this, but you do see them. And Jordan, I think you're right. I think she sees the lens and sees her reflection or something like that. That totally makes sense. And it's cool that she's thinking about it. <laughs> if he bit me, I could climb buildings. That would be something. I would go for some Phidippus powers. I could be Phidippus man. Why not? Okay. Wow, time flies. Oh, Therapon Hunter. Yeah, nudibranchs are pretty cool. I remember my wife found a Spanish dancer nudibranch in Hawaii when we lived there at the beach. It was so cool. It was beautiful. It looked like a living flame. It was orange and yellow and red. So cool. So your chameleon tried it once and he hates it, huh? Interesting. 
And Beetle Breeding Vincent Gomez, you're back as a mod. Interesting. That's cool. Tunicut Pog, Space Kraken X. Oh, this is an inside joke he's telling me because this is my son. <laughs> he is... Oh, actually, Newt, you know what? Um, we are going to do it. We're working on it. We totally are. Um, Clint and I have communicated about that. We're excited to do it, um, and we're going to do it. So I appreciate the suggestion, and and yeah, it's it's going to happen. We're just not sure when yet. We're we're working out a, a time that's working going to work for both of us. So I can't make any promises. It's going to be super soon, but I'm excited to do it. I'll tell you that. I love Clint's channel. I love his energy and enthusiasm. His knowledge, he's great. So I'm all over it. As soon as we can do it, I'm there. So, let's see. So how long do these spiders live? Only about a year to two years. Hmm. Oh, so I remember you were getting um, emperor scorpions for uh, forest oasis. Yeah, I wonder if it's molting. Am I an entomologist? No, I am not. I have studied that on my own. But uh, I, I don't have an, a degree in entomology. Could I suppose to be cohabited with a small tarantula for bioactivity purposes? Yes. Yes, they could. Um, some people have noticed... I mean, there are a lot of people who keep isopods as a cleanup crew with, uh, with tarantulas. And there are some people who have had issues with it. Uh, with, for example, a molting tarantula being attacked, but I think in general that's when the isopods have overpopulated, and often the um, molting platforms kind of protect them. But I've I've heard issues. I've heard issues do happen with it sometimes, but I've also heard of a lot of people having success with it. Since I've never kept tarantulas, I can't say too much on it. Oh, I wasn't far enough away to do a jump. You want to do a jump? Let's do a jump. You can do it. Do a real one. Let's do a proper jump. Nice. There you go. And I don't think they can, I mean, they can bite you and it would hurt, but they're not likely to bite you. Let's put it that way. Jordan, thank you. Love the super chat. Really appreciate it. You've always been a great supporter of Aquarimax in so many ways. And that's just one of many ways that you have supported Aquarimax. I really, really appreciate it. So that's awesome, Jordan. I, I really, really... Love the super chats. Help keep Aquarimax going. Springtail safe with scorpions. Um, yes, uh, if the springtails are definitely safe with scorpions, meaning they're not going to harm the scorpion. Um, they're certain if it's like your emperor scorpion, then you're probably not going to have a problem because they require enough humidity that springtails will tend to be, do just fine. There are springtails that can't survive with a scorpion because it's too dry with certain species. Um, so, yeah, those dwarf whites will probably eventually populate. Probably be fine. Ah, Linda Rodriguez. I didn't know that uh, spiders... Is it... They're allergic to, like, the hairs on the spider? That's interesting. I, didn't, I hadn't heard of that. Hmm. You know what? Yeah, I'm kind of... I, I probably do need to clip my nails, but... This is the deal. My nails grow faster than the average person's nails. You can ask anybody in my family. And I really try to keep on top of it, but I don't really appreciate it when people bug me about it. I don't. So, um, here we go. So I appreciate those of you who have seen them and not made any comments about them. That I, I do appreciate that. Well, I guess we're, we're coming down on the hour now. Um, yeah. Do I have any tips for gargs? I know you have two Cresties, but they're quite similar. Yeah, I've never kept um, gargoyle geckos, and I have done an interview on one 
uh, of a keeper who uh, had one and he came in and talked about it. So if you do a gargoyle gecko Aquarimax search on YouTube, you'll, you'll come up with that interview and that would probably help. I would say I don't, don't exactly feel qualified giving tips about them so much uh, because I've never kept one. But I would say that since they can't climb glass, with their claws, then you'd probably want to make sure that the climbing surfaces are a little, uh, you know, arranged so such that they can make take advantage of the size of their enclosure, uh, because they won't be able to take advantage of the glass like a crusty can. Like when I when I put morning geckos or crusties in an enclosure, I'm mindful of the fact that they're going to be able to take advantage of the uh, lid of the enclosure and all the walls of the enclosure as you know use, used space, but. Um, it's not uh, that the case with gargoyle geckos. So I would design the enclosure with that in mind to make sure you can take advantage of the enclosure with um, branches and things like that. Um, let's see. Let's see, a joke at the end. I need to do a joke at the end. I should have saved a joke for the end. I didn't think of that. I'll try to do that next time though. That's a good idea. And thank you, Forest Oasis. Oh, she's getting caught in my arm here. Here. And these spiders are not the wild ones. Are not tame. I have a wild caught Audax that showed up in on our back door, on the inside of the back door. A little baby one caught it. It's not anywhere near this tame. So, yeah, and I think jumping spiders can be a great pet for children. They need to be treated with supervision, as long as they're you know, uh, an adult is the one who's doing most of the handling until the kids have learned how to do it properly, but sure, I mean, they're fairly low maintenance, they're beautiful, they help uh, acclimate the kids to spiders and know that spiders are typically not an issue, but I would say you don't want to hand a jumping spider to a young child who doesn't know how to handle one because they could easily hurt it, but other than that, yeah, sure, definitely. And Theropod Hunter, I'm not sure, mine had a huge number of babies, there must have been well over a hundred in each egg sack, and I think she had two. Uh, so yeah. And Rochelle, yeah, they are, they are marvelous. They're marvelous little spiders. They really are. They're about the only spider my wife will let me keep, but I can see why. They're so different from other spiders. Um, so Phidippus jumping spiders are okay with her, and I think they're my favorite spider anyway, so we'll go with that. Oh, I love it. Mickey's brought us a joke. How do you tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? The alligator will see you later and the croc will see you in a while. Love it. <laughs> I don't think I've heard that one. That's awesome. And what is a spider's favorite TV show? Okay, I'm waiting for this one, Wally. I, I can't think of that one, but uh, I want to hear the answer. Spider-Man. That works. But I think you're going to say something else. Let's see. Okay, Wally, I give up. What is it? I think Padme is waiting for it, too. She was looking at the screen ex expectingly, expectantly. I got to know the answer now. <laughs> the newly web game. Cool. Yep, you got me with something unexpected. That's awesome. Well, this is a Phidippus regius. A species native to the southeastern U.S. All right. Well, we've only got about a minute left, folks. Go ahead and give it a jump. Yep, that's true. Phidippus regius. Oh, you decided to be lazy and not jump. Let's see if you can do another jump before the end, huh? Are you going to do another jump for me? You can do it. Let's do it. Let's do the jump. I think she's going to do it. You going to jump? Oh, maybe not. Maybe no jump. Okay, well, everyone. It is time to go. So thank you for joining in the stream. Thank you for to the mods for protecting the stream. 
Thank you for, to Jordan for the super chat. That's so awesome. And thank you to you all for everything. And I've got some fun stuff coming up. We've got an expo this weekend. So, yep, there's are going to be some fun stuff associated with that. And everybody have a great day and we'll see you on Friday.